but you care. And Lord, as there are a lot of different ways that this passage could be misinterpreted, misheard, um, I just pray that you would cover us, you would give us understanding and grace for each other. Let me pray this in Jesus' name. If you know me, uh, well, first of all, there's a lot of you, I think, maybe who don't know me. My name is Shannon. I work um, on the directional leadership team here at Loft and closely with Sam administratively. Um, I've been a part of Loft for four years, and it's been a real blessing and honor to be a part of this church family. Um, But if you know me a little more personally, you know that the movie The Princess Bride is one of my all-time favorites, and it's extremely quotable. But there is one quote in particular that I love. Believing that her beloved Wesley is long dead, Princess Buttercup accuses the dread pirate Roberts, who is really Wesley, of mocking her pain. And he responds, life is pain, highness. Anyone who tells you differently is selling something. Life is pain. Now, I wouldn't add this quote to the canon of scripture, but the Bible is very clear that as believers, we should not be surprised by the pain and suffering that comes into our lives. Jesus himself said in the book of John, you will have suffering in this world. And Peter says, dear friends, do not be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. We are told again and again in the scriptures to expect pain and hardship, loss and suffering. Life is pain. So where are you hurting this morning? What trial are you walking through right now? Your trial may be emotional, a struggle with anxiety or depression, loneliness or rejection or it may be relational a broken relationship with a spouse or a parent a friend or a child it may be physical maybe a loved one is in the hospital fighting for their life battling cancer or you yourself are struggling with a temporary or chronic illness It may be a temptation, a struggle with a sin that is wreaking havoc on your life. Or it may even be financial, wondering where the next rent payment is coming from, or unsure how many more miles your car will drive before the duct tape just doesn't cut it anymore. Sean and Aaron. I know several of our Loft family here, myself included, have recently lost loved ones, and that grief never fully goes away. I could go on and on, and if I just listed the trials and hardships currently being experienced by everybody in this room, it would take up all of my time. (laughs) But if this pain is so prevalent, so inevitable in each of our lives, It seems paramount that we know how, as believers, we should respond to it. It's astounding to me how much effort we put forth as the human race trying to rid ourselves of pain and protect ourselves from loss. We push and pull, struggle to attain that perfect moment of happiness of satisfaction where everything seems right in the world. We stuff down and push through our pain. We numb ourselves with entertainment and fill our lives so full we couldn't possibly feel anything. Or we become the victim. We are consumed by our pain and allow our trials and suffering to define us. We think we are the only people who have ever felt the way that we do, and we want to give up. These trials naturally cause us, in small ways or big ways, to question our faith. Does God really love us? 
Is he truly good? Can I trust him with my heart, my relationships, my finances, my health? When life gets hard, when your happiness, your comfort, and your security is threatened or completely demolished, how do you respond? How are you responding? How, as believers, should we respond to the trials, the hardships, the suffering that we inevitably face? What does it look like to face the difficult circumstances in our lives with faith? James speaks directly to this question in his letter. As Sam said last year, are likely faced with the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. James calls us to respond to the trials in our lives with joy. When suffering or difficulty of any kind comes our way, our faith leads us into joy. I think the first question we have to answer here is, what, it, what does he mean by joy? I think this passage has been misused and abused way too many times, um, told to people who are really hurting, expecting them to just be okay, right? James is not saying that Christians have to have a ha be happy and bubbly all the time, that we have to walk around with a fake smile plastered on our face, unfazed by suffering. Joy is not the absence of sadness, or anger, or loneliness, or grief. Something that is a joy, a great joy, is something of great value and worth. James is saying, consider it of great value when you face trials of many kinds. And when we recognize the value in something, we find a sense of contentment, confidence, hope, and well-being. Joy is an orientation of the heart toward God, a deep knowing and assurance of who God is that transcends circumstances. Consider a mother in labor. She sees the value in her labor pains, knowing that the fruit of her labor will be a child. She is not happy in the midst of labor, at least I've never met a mother who is happy in the middle of labor, but she is confident in the process. She breathes through the pain and anticipates the outcome. So what is the fruit of our labor through trials? Why are trials of such great value to the believer? Believer and achieve unshakable faith. No, endurance and steadfastness must complete its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, it's a growth process. Consider an athlete. They do not prepare for the Olympics by sitting on the couch, eating ice cream, and watching Netflix. <laughs> we all wish it was so. <laughs> no, they train day in and day out. They exercise with blood, sweat, and tears, building muscle and stamina one day at a time until they've reached their goal. And they do this with joy because they know that the harder the training they undergo, the stronger they become and the better prepared they are for victory. No pain, no gain. That's what we say, right? But this is the same, in the same way that our bodies need exercise, our spiritual muscles also need tending. Without any resistance, our faith will be flabby, weak, untested. 
easily susceptible to injury. Every time we respond to trials in faith, we are strengthening our spiritual core. We are moving towards spiritual maturity. We are becoming more like Jesus. And that is the most valuable thing of all, is it not? But this brings us to the real question. Maybe you've bought into the fact that trials in our lives can be valuable when they're responded to in faith. But the real question is how? How do we really do this? Sorry. I have small ears. (laughs) First of all, God must change the desires of our hearts. What do you want most in life? What are you pursuing and why? If you are not intentional about pursuing Jesus above all else, then your default is to pursue and worship your own comfort, advancement, and pleasure. If our greatest desire is a life of comfort and ease, security and abundance, then we will never find joy in our trials. We will kick and scream and fight our way through each one. But if we want to be like Jesus, if we want to reach spiritual maturity, if we want to increase our faith, then we will see the immense value in trials and rejoice, even while suffering greatly. I want to be clear, just a side note here, that it doesn't mean that we're masochistic, that we um, go looking for trials. (laughs) But when God allows it into our lives, we receive it with open hands, considering it of great value for the spiritual training that it provides. The Interpreter's Bible puts it this way. To be able to avoid difficulties and bask in pleasurable and undisturbed tranquility is the greatest goal. We all have that vision, right, of floating out on a lake or whatever your, you know, fantasy is of the perfect moment. We all, we all have that. We want to avoid difficulties We are moved by the promptings of a nature in love with ease and superficiality. If we show any interest in religion, it is in the hope that it will be of some help in securing for us this sort of happiness. If, in spite of it all, we meet difficulties or trials, these are the cause of complaint and mental misery. James has a different ideal of happiness because he holds a different theory of the meaning and purpose of life. The purpose of life cannot be accomplished by the attainment of ease or luxurious comfort, but only in the achievement of Christ-like character. The purpose and meaning of our life must change if we are to find joy in our trials. The Christian can count it all joy when we meet various trials because these test the fortitude of our faith in God's overruling purpose. And when met with courage, they produce steadfastness of character. This joy is deeper and more abiding than the superficial pleasures of the moment which pass so quickly. James calls us to respond to our trials with joy, to reorient our entire thinking, our desires, our being towards God and his purpose and the meaning that he gives us for our lives. But he also recognizes that we don't have the ability to do this on our own. The thing that we lack most when facing trials in our lives is wisdom. Read with me, beginning in verse 5. 
Now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. We are able to respond to the trials in our lives with joy when we obtain the wisdom of God. We experience joy in the midst of trials when we see as God sees. James connects verses 4 and 5 with this word lacks. So at the end of verse 4, he says that we may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. But then in verse 5 he says, But if any of you lacks wisdom... So we see here that he's talking about lacking wisdom in the midst of trials. The one, sorry, but what is, if you are struggling to face your trials in faith with joy, as we all do, we must seek the wisdom of God. But what is wisdom? I feel like it's a word we throw out there a lot in Christian circles um, that's kind of meaningless. Uh, it's not just intellectual knowledge. It's entirely practical. Wisdom is seeing as God sees and acting accordingly. It is knowledge of the deep things of God turned into action in the decisions and personal relationships of everyday life. When we need this wisdom in the midst of trials, James says we should ask God, who gives to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. This is a powerful promise. God wants us to come to him for wisdom. And he will give above and beyond and not rebuke us for it or keep a tally of what he has given. He wants to give generously to us, but we must humble ourselves and ask. By asking God for wisdom, we are confessing our own insufficiency and inadequacy in the face of our circumstances. We come humbly to God not in an attempt to impose our will on him, but rather to open our hearts to the transforming work of the Spirit of God. But, there's a but, we must ask in faith and without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. An indecisive man is unstable in all his ways. So what is going on here? Does God hold out on us until we muster up enough faith in our prayers to give us wisdom? Is he up in heaven scouring our prayers, looking for any sign of doubt so that he can withhold his wisdom from us? Emphatically, no. (laughs) Don't stop listening there. (laughs) No. (laughs) The truth is, the wisdom of God has deep roots in the soil of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to attain God's wisdom. If we ask God for his wisdom, but are unwilling to trust him, to believe him, to have faith to the point of acting on it, that knowledge will be fruitless. God's wisdom is so often counterintuitive and countercultural. And so we must have faith that God's way is better and will yield the desired results. As we continue to study James, you'll see this theme often of what we naturally tend to think and what God's kingdom is like. And we'll see that again and again, that God flips that on its head. 
And so unless we believe, unless we have faith and trust in God's kingdom, his kingdom way, we can't attain his wisdom. He can't give it to us. A doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. When we doubt God, we become controlled by our circumstances. Our sense of joy, of well-being, of confidence and hope is shattered by every new challenging circumstance. We are up, and then we're down, and then we're up, and then we're down, and then we're up again, and we can't decide if God is trustworthy. We say, God, give me wisdom, but then immediately take it into our own hands and do everything that is humanly possible to try and solve the problem. We say, lead me, God, except in the direction I do not want to go. The one who doubts is like a drunk man stumbling aimlessly down the street, constantly changing direction and easily toppled by anyone or anything that passes by. This person is in no condition to receive anything from God. And this image of the waves and the surging of the sea and the instability is in stark contrast to the believer in chapter 2 who is in chapter verse 2 who is steadfast who has endurance of faith. This person is standing on the street with their spiritual core engaged. They're ready, alert for whatever comes their way. So I have to take a moment here to just note when we ask God for wisdom in faith, how does he give it to us? think sometimes we all wish that there was an audible voice of God, right? <laughs> we pray and we want him to tell us exactly what to do in that moment. But I believe that God's primary means, not only, but primary means of imparting wisdom is through his word. And you'll see this fleshed out later in James. When you are faced with trials, pray and ask God for wisdom and then immerse yourself in his word. Read, study, and meditate on his word, and then choose to believe and act on what is written. Learn the character of God. Learn to see yourself and others as God sees you. Gain his perspective on your circumstances, and then walk in obedience, which is the true marker of your faith. We find joy in the midst of our trials when we see as God sees. We see as God sees when we read his word. Sean, I need you to come up here for a second. We're going to pick on you. I want you to take this rope here and just check it out. Let me know if it's strong and sound. No, check it out. <laughs> Seems legit. Okay, would you, if I, you know, tied your hands behind your back with that rope, do you think it's strong? It would hold? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what about if uh, with that same rope I had it tied to a tree branch hanging over a cliff. Would you, would you hold on to it? Yeah. Yes? I mean, that's the only option. <laughs> you have an option. Then no. Then no. Okay, that's the right answer, because this thing only holds 60 pounds. Uh, <laughs> but, thank you, Sean. We, you never know how much you really believe in a thing until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. We can say this rope is strong, 
but then would you put your life in its hands? When we face trials in our life, the true nature of our faith is revealed. Will we place the full weight of our lives on the rope of God's character, his promises, his power? Or will we abandon it for something seemingly safer and try to build our own rickety bridges across the chasm? The beautiful thing is that as we trust in God's rope, forgive the bad metaphor, but as we trust, (laughs) this is 3.30 in the morning last night, Um, as we trust in God's character, as we use the rope, to get across these chasms of trials in our lives, our faith in it becomes more and more secure. The more we use it, we've seen God's faithfulness in the past. We've seen him carry through. We've seen his words ring true in our lives. And as we face more and more trials, we grab hold of the rope confidently. We build calluses on our hands. And we no longer hesitate to put the full weight of our lives in God's hands. The continual testing of our faith produces steadfastness. And when we've seen God's faithfulness and experienced the joy of surrender in the past, we don't hesitate to place our trust in him again. Two weeks ago, um, a dear friend and mentor of mine went to be with Jesus unexpectedly. Tim was a man of small stature, but he was a spiritual giant. One of the most loving, compassionate, grace-filled people I have ever met. And since his passing, I've heard countless people say something along the lines of, I wish I was more like Tim. By which I think they mean, I wish I was more godly and less selfish. I wish I loved people as well as Tim did and exuded the same grace and compassion and faith. And I've thought the same thing myself. I think we all have at least one person in our lives that we feel this way about. Whether they're still alive or not, we want to be like them, right? We want to follow them as they have followed Jesus. But I've realized in my grief over the past few weeks that Tim was who he was significantly because of the pain and the trials that he himself experienced. His faith was forged in the fire of suffering and hardship. He weathered the trials in his life well, and the result was Christ-like character. In the face of suffering, Tim pressed in to Jesus. He walked through darkest valleys with great faith, unwavering hope, and confident in God's unfailing love for him. And he invited others. He invited me, and if he were here, he would invite you too now to do the same. In the storms of your life, do you find yourself on the sure footing of your faith or floundering in the waves of your circumstances? Ask God for wisdom in faith. Our trials and suffering, the pain that we endure in this life, will change and shape us. No matter how much you try to deny it or ignore it or whatever you do with it, it will change you. The question is, will it change you for the better or the worse? Will you become bitter and angry, hateful and resentful? Or will you become more like Jesus? The mark of a Christian is not the lack of suffering and trials in our lives, but rather how we choose to respond. 
When we face our trials with faith, we find joy knowing that they will increase our character. They will make us more like Jesus. And as we take communion today, let us look to Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus is our perfect example. As we take communion, we remember the sufferings of Christ, his body broken for us, his blood spilled out for us. We are not alone in our suffering. Jesus has been where we are, and he weeps with you. As we take communion, receive the joy that God has for you in faith.